Welcome to this edition of Astro Vignettes. My name is Professor Michael DeRobertis and I will be your guide on this journey. Our lesson today will focus on the scientific method, what it is, how it is applied, challenges we face in some of its applications and assessing evidence, and science's limitations. It's interesting to note that the very word science originates in the Latin word scientia, which means knowledge. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to describe the scientific method and its five steps, explain the importance of testability, identify the different types of evidence and how to assess them, recognize the significance of potential bias and how to deal with it, and understand the limitations of the scientific method. What exactly is the scientific method? Generally speaking, science is a method, a method to uncover truths about the natural world. It consists of five basic steps. The first step is to observe a pattern and to ask a question about it. The second step is to propose a generalization based on our observations and form a testable hypothesis. Third, we make predictions based on our hypothesis that we then test through experiments and further observations. Our experiments may or may not verify our predictions. If our predictions prove to be incorrect, we have to go back and reject or revise our hypothesis and its predictions and then repeat the testing. If our predictions prove to be correct, we can temporarily accept our hypothesis and communicate its results, usually through peer review. Let's look at the following narrative example that illustrates some of these key steps. When Sarah was a child, she often visited her grandfather's farm. Her grandfather had some animals on his farm, including sheep, which Sarah liked to watch. At the farm, the sheep all had white wool. Without realizing it, Sarah came to believe that sheep all have the same color of wool. Philosophers refer to the process of generalizing from a particular set of observations like this as induction. In a way, induction relies on pattern recognition, which was essential to the survival and evolution of our species. Humans rely a great deal on inductive reasoning in daily life, including when practicing science. The belief that all sheep have white wool might also be called a hypothesis. Later that year, Sarah's mother bought some wool socks that were navy blue. Sarah was aware that wool comes from sheep, and so Sarah was puzzled. How could navy blue wool come from sheep which had white wool? This was a serious challenge or test to Sarah's hypothesis that all sheep had white wool. Sarah's mother saved Sarah's hypothesis when she explained to Sarah about the dyeing of wool, just like some people dye their hair. There didn't have to be sheep with navy blue wool, just sheep whose wool can be dyed. Next summer, Sarah's grandfather invited her to his farm again. She was quite excited because he told her he had just bought a few dozen more sheep. When Sarah got to the farm, however, she was puzzled. Among the new flock was a sheep that had gray wool. Sarah knew her hypothesis was in trouble again. She ran to her grandfather to ask whether the sheep with gray wool had had its wool dyed. But her grandfather assured her that gray was the natural color of the sheep's wool. Sarah was in a quandary. She had to either abandon or revise her hypothesis on the basis of this latest test or observation or evidence. Sarah decided to revise her hypothesis to most sheep have wool that is white but a few may have wool that is gray. This seemed more consistent with her observations. Later in life Sarah would come to realize that sheep wool, though mostly white in color, can be a variety of colors including gray and even brown, though never navy blue. 
This simple example illustrates how science actually works in practice. Each branch of science may develop its own jargon and may use mathematics to a greater or lesser degree to articulate its hypotheses, but the scientific method consists of asking questions or noticing a pattern, compiling careful observations, as well as proposing, testing, and revising hypotheses. A scientist may spend most of her career on simply testing and revising hypotheses, relying on other scientists to acquire data or frame hypotheses. In the end, however, scientists communicate their conclusions through publications, normally after careful review by some peers, to ensure sufficient rigor was used to reach these conclusions. As you have seen, for a hypothesis to be functional in the context of the scientific method, it has to be testable to determine whether it might be true. There are two important aspects of testability. First, a hypothesis must be falsifiable. This means it must be capable of being shown to be false. In science, there is no absolute proof for a hypothesis. There is only a preponderance of evidence. One might hypothesize, like Bertrand Russell, that there is a silver teapot orbiting the sun somewhere between the orbits of Earth and Mars. While an easy hypothesis to state, it would be almost impossible at our current level of technology to test. The second concept underlying testability is repeatability or reproducibility. If one scientist concludes something based on an experiment, that same conclusion should be reached by another researcher independently who had performed a similar experiment if the conclusion were indeed a fact of nature. In the late 20th century, two researchers claimed to find evidence for cold fusion, that is, for a power source in a simple lab experiment that we know operates in the centers of stars. If this were true, this would have amazing consequences for humankind, a cheap, clean, unlimited energy supply. Trouble is, scientists and other labs could not replicate or reproduce these results, and so this hypothesis slowly faded away. The quality of evidence is critical in assessing or testing a hypothesis, and not just for science, but for any truth claim. Most of us rely on authorities or authoritative sources to help us assess certain truth claims. How we choose these experts is critical if we really are interested in making an impartial assessment. Suppose we would like to know how likely it is that Earth will suffer a collision with a major solar system body in the next century. It would make sense in this case to consult an astronomer who specializes in our solar system rather than a website of someone who promotes government cover-ups and conspiracy theories. When we become better informed on the subject, it might be fun to look over such a website to identify the techniques used to persuade the uninformed. But when first setting out on a search for truth, it's prudent to steer clear of sources whose authority is questionable. There are two basic types of evidence that are commonly available to humans, anecdotal and statistical. Anecdotal evidence refers to evidence that comes from personal testimony. Many day-to-day -day decisions we make are based on such evidence. For example, if I really like the shoes you're wearing, I may ask where you bought them so I could get a pair. Important to me, but pretty unimportant in, to society in general. Now, what if you told me that your aunt cured her cancer by eating potato peels? Should I recommend eating potato peels to the next person I learn who has cancer? Should our government immediately integrate this therapy into the healthcare system? Assessing issues of such major consequence require much deeper investigation. This is where statistical testing comes in. Statistical evidence and testing allow us to determine whether there is any real connection between, say, eating potato peels and curing cancer by carrying out a systematic study. To put this more formally, is there a correlation between eating potato peels and curing cancer? This can be a challenging, time-consuming, and expensive enterprise, but it is the only way we can be sure of determining whether there is a real connection. It does not make sense to develop healthcare policy or deploy limited resources on anything that has not been carefully scrutinized in this way. A caveat, however, even though statistical testing can reveal a correlation between two variables, it cannot normally determine whether the variables are causally related. That is, what exactly about potato peels cures cancer? 
In more formal language, be careful of making the unwarranted assumption that correlation implies causation. Your age is well correlated with the price of ice cream, but few of us would say that the two are causally related. On the other hand, the good correlation between smoking and lung cancer is causal. It is also important to be aware that the more extraordinary the claim, the more extraordinary the evidence must be. Should humankind believe that space aliens are visiting Earth simply because your cousin saw an unidentified flying object last week? The criminal courts follow this strict requirement. A person is normally not convicted of murder based solely on circumstantial evidence. The legal analogy is also important in illustrating the importance of the burden of proof. A person is innocent until proven guilty. The burden of proof is on the prosecutor to demonstrate the defendant is guilty based on evidence. This is also true in science. The burden of proof is always on a challenging rather than the currently accepted theory. A great deal of evidence has accumulated over the last century supporting Einstein's theory of general relativity, for example. And yet, scientists hear from people all the time who claim Einstein was wrong and their theory is right. The burden of proof in this context is clearly on the maverick to prove evidence his theory is better supported than Einstein's, and that on science to demonstrate the new theory is incorrect. It is actually a common tactic of mavericks to demand that scientists must prove them wrong. It is also helpful to be aware that it is very difficult to prove a negative. While it may be possible to provide excellent evidence that a live, full-grown elephant is not in the room with you at this moment, it, it is nearly impossible to prove something more general like, there is no tooth fairy. Humans, including scientists, are susceptible to a variety of challenges when working with data. In science, observations used to test a hypothesis can be biased, that is, they do not faithfully represent the objects or populations under study. We distinguish between three major types of biases, technical or analytical bias, cognitive bias, and confirmation bias. Technical or analytical bias can be a result of using instruments that are flawed or because the observational techniques are flawed. For example, you wouldn't weigh yourself on a scale that registers 20 kilograms before you even stepped on the scale. Or, suppose you were asked to consider how fast the average 20-year-old female can run a distance of 200 meters. It would be foolish to use data from the finals of this event at the last Olympics to make such an estimate. Human beings are subject to all sorts of cognitive biases. We evolved over very long time scales. Our very survival was aided by the ability to identify and interpret patterns, patterns that may not even be there. A rustle in the bushes may well only be the result of a breeze and not of a tiger ready to pounce, but we couldn't very well take the time to perform a scientific experiment on the spot to see which hypothesis is true, could we? In a similar manner, our brains often identify two sequential events as being causally related even though they aren't. For example, suppose you saw a black cat walk across your path on the street, and then you got into an argument with your best friend later that day. Superstitions sometimes emerge from this type of erroneous thinking, for example, that a black cat brings bad luck. One of the most common biases we encounter is called confirmational bias. For example, you really hate checking out at a large grocery store because you swear you almost always seem to get in the slowest line. Maybe but you're less likely to remember occasions when your checkout time was average or even quicker than average, and more likely to recall the few annoying times when you chose a slow line. The latter nicely confirms what you already imagined to be the case, whether true or not. This type of bias is very common in science and in everyday life, contributing to some forms of prejudice. It is also a significant contributor to the increasing polarization we experience in the current era of fake news. We find news told from a perspective more sympathetic to our own view is more trustworthy than news told from a challenging perspective. Ideally, we should assess the value of each item on its own merit. There is no doubt 
that the scientific method is the most effective way of determining truths about our natural world, the world of atoms, bacteria, stars. But it has limitations that need to be respected. First, the scientific method deals with propositions involving the natural world, proposition connected by reason and logic. It makes no prior assumptions about the supernatural or even whether the supernatural world exists at all. As a result, science cannot affirm whether there is or is not a god, for example. Second, some people particularly buoyed by the success of science over the past few centuries maintain that the scientific method is the only reliable method for determining truth, period. Quite apart from reducing other areas of human knowledge, such as the study of history or literature, to lesser importance, it denies the existence of the supernatural by definition. This inappropriate extension of the scientific method has recently become more common, including among scientists, and needs to be identified for what it is. Third, and finally, science is often called upon to make moral or value judgments. It is important to note that science itself cannot make value judgments. People can make value judgments based in part on scientific information, but humans, not science, decide whether something is good or bad. Let's review what we have learned from this vignette. The scientific method is a highly reliable way of determining truths about the natural world. It is composed of five steps observations and asking questions, making generalizations to form a testable hypothesis, making and testing predictions based on the hypothesis, and then either revising or rejecting the original hypothesis, or if it's verified, communicating the results. For a hypothesis to be functional in the context of the scientific method, it has to be testable, that is, both falsifiable and reproducible. When assessing evidence, one must be aware of the role of authority. We also need to distinguish between anecdotal evidence versus statistical evidence and testing. One of the two basic tenets of assessing evidence is that the more extraordinary the claim, the more extraordinary the evidence must be. The second tenet is that the onus is always on the challenger to demonstrate the superiority of their hypothesis over a currently accepted hypothesis. The application of the scientific method is subject to human error, more specifically bias. Three of the most common biases are technical or analytical bias, cognitive biases, and confirmation bias. Much like all other human endeavors, the application of the scientific method has limitations. Those who engage in the application of the scientific method, whether they be scientists or non-scientists, must always be acutely aware of these limitations. Thank you for taking this journey with me on the scientific method. <laughs>